For SSC devices, it is more like Linux is the TV. So you need to have full control over all the possibilities and then an application software provides that high level slider or control for the end user. But it is responsible itself to set up the best possible quality. So it may have to change lots of different controls to get the best quality there. Uh, well, it's used for well, no surprise digital cameras, TVs, mobile phones, video plays, etc. But several years ago, Video for Linux didn't support these capabilities, so vendors <laughs> did what vendors do, and that is make their own. So you ended up with lots of competing APIs, none of them upstream, all different, all proprietary. Um, when I started on this several years ago, uh, I started, actually, it started out with a chip, that complex chip, whose blog that I get my show, started out of talks and stacks of instruments on how to do this better. Um, the first RFC with the whole idea, sort of a roadmap of what we wanted to do, appeared in July 2008. We had lots of discussions, meetings, media summits, brainstorm sessions in order to do all this. And actually tomorrow we will have another great uh, media summit and we are very important to discuss more issues. So it's an ongoing process. Uh, it turned out that, you know, this fair, relatively simple things you can do very well on main lists. If you have a really complex issue that you want to resolve, then there is no substitute for just a face-to-face -face team. Get the experts in the room and hammer it out. But one thing that we really needed to do at the beginning when we started out is, okay, Video for Linux had a very, very small core framework. Basically, there was some support for a video node, and we had support for video buffer handling. That was it. Compared to the other subsystems in the kernel, really small. And in order to do lots of the more complex things that we needed to do for SLCs, you first needed to improve the framework. So some essential uh, structures were introduced. One of them, the first one is FIFRA 2 device, which is sort of your high level data structure. Um, in hindsight, this was a poor name. I wish we had used something like FIFRA 2 roots, as it's really your root structure from which you can find all the others. Um, another very important one, and uh, Laurent mentioned it as well in his presentation, where was the struct PFRL to subdev, which we, video, for video devices, they tend to have a constellation of devices. So you have your main bridge, the USB or PCI platform device, the USB DMA engine, and then you have a variety of I squared, usually I squared C devices that do video capture, video transmitting, uh, video improvements, uh, audio as well for TV capture, parts, you have tuners. You, you have a huge amount of sub-devices that are controlled by the top level bridge, PCI or PCI bridge, USB bridge or platform device. And we needed some abstraction because we were in the stage that some, some of those drivers were tied to certain high-level drivers, and they were not reusable. So we designed the FIFRA to subdev device. You only need to know whether it's an I squared C or a platform or some other device when you initialize it or when you take it down. After that, you just reference FIFRA to subdev, which is basically C++ uh, inheritance. And the nice thing about the subdevice concept is that it's abstract. So typically a sub-device represents an ISPC device, but it can also represent an SPI device, a GPIO device, or an IP block inside an SOC. And that makes it possible to write a driver for an IP block, and in an extra vision of the SOC, which instead of say one scaler has multiple scalers, you can just reuse that driver. And that's a very nice way of creating building blocks that you can use in larger SOCs and once you do that you can have a much more evolution in how you uh, handle this in the future. It should make the time to market a lot shorter but uh, just getting to that point that you can actually do this for the first time that takes a much that takes a really long time because you really need to figure out what your building blocks are and make the appropriate drivers for it. 
Uh, modern knife sling is it can actually be used to expose internals of a sub device because a sub device can be associated with a device mode through which you can set up internals of that sub device. It's not always used, but especially on the SOC where you need to have full control. This is very handy to provide a standard way of setting those things up. Um, one of the final structures was a structure representing a file handle. Uh, it's very useful, especially for introducing some core support for certain features and uh, for event handling. I'll get to that later. Another important framework is the control framework. Video fitness devices, just like all software implemented, they have lots of controls, brightness, contrast, but also uh, bit rates for video and an MPEG encoder. And the API for that, uh, the initial API was pretty simple, later it became a bit more complex because you need to be able to set multiple controls in an atomic operation. Especially initially that was necessary for MPEG encoders, but there are also other uses, for example, if you have a, uh, a camera where you want to get the position of the camera where it's pointed to, that is usually say an X, Y, and Z, and you want to get all three controls in one atomic operation. So, that's handling atomic settings of multiple controls in one go, that's quite complex. And some drivers did it right, others didn't do it. Uh, there were lots of variety in how drivers handle things. So the control framework was created to make it easy for drivers to use controls. And the control framework takes care of most of the hard work. Um, it does some caching. So if you have set a register and you just want to get it, Unless it is a volatile register, sorry, I shouldn't say register, I should say control, there can be multiple registers involved in one control. But the control value is cached, so if you just get the current value, then it's, then it's done very fast without access to the ISCOT CBUS. A future enhancement that I would like to do is to actually show X controls in debug FS, so that you can just set it using the shell script. Uh, I have code for that, so I haven't had the time to actually. You can inherit controls, so a bridge driver can have its own controls, but it can also inherit controls from, a, for example, a tuner or a sub device or a video receiver and show them all together to the end user. This makes it very easy for application, for a driver writer to use controls because lots of the things that you would expect to happen happen automatically. And this was version 2.6.36 and later we also added an event you can get when a control changes value, and that was added in 3.1. Another thing that you want to do with SOCs, SOCs use a lot of them use high definition TV. Let's be honest, PAL and NTC that's on the way out if it's not already uh, disabled completely by your cable company. Uh, originally, the API that was introduced was a preset API, so you would just say, okay, what 720p60, and it would set up the standard timings for that. Um, it was easy to use, but it was not powerful enough. What we also did at the time was to create an API to set up exact timings, basically a mode set, just for video flicks. It, it's the same information, except using video flicks API. Um, since the preset API turned out to be insufficient, we later extended the, the timings API so that you could enumerate valid timings and query the timing that the, the receiver is currently seeing on its input. That was version 3.5 and the preset API is on its way out. So it's currently uh, only one or two drivers that are still using it and I want them to switch over to the timings API as well. At that moment, the preset API will go away. Don't use it the new drivers. It looked nice when we designed it. it turned out to be uh, too simplistic. Another uh, reason this is why this is version 3.7. A recent uh, enhancement is support for uh, some of the, the, the awesome ends that are involved with certain connectors, particularly HDMI, DVI, VGA, display port. They need things like EDID handling. Um, we all know that for output devices, of course, and DRM, they use it as well. But we are also, Video Linux is also taking care of capture devices. 
So for a capture device, you actually need to be able to set up the EDID yourself. So you need support to set up the EDID. You need support for detecting upload changes, RxS detection. So all sort of little things. And one, some connectors have a list of them. Others have only a subset. Um, so this was this was added in 3.7, and that made it possible to upstream the first high definition receiver and transmitter drive as well. We needed, we also needed an extra feature that, uh, so we have events when controls changes. And uh, things like what plug is implemented as a control. It's a read only control, and when, it, when a drive detects a hot plug, it will change the value of that. And an application can get an event, hey, we have to change the hot plug status. If this is, however, done in a sub device, then that event needs to go to the bridge driver to handle it. And there was no support for that connection between the subdivider and the bridge driver. Code for that has been added. Uh, there's a patch around. I'm not sure if it's merged yet. I need to follow up on that. It should appear in 3.8. It's, it's a pretty simple feature, but it's absolutely required. Events API. Uh, as I said already, you want to get events when a whole book changes or, or a format on an input changes, all sorts of things like that. We would like to use select. We, we use video notes, we open the video notes, that's through, through that video note we get our video frames. So it would be very nice if we could get events through that same note as well. Uh, we've done that using exceptions. Um, was version 2.655, there were some uh, problems with it. Primarily you could lose, in certain circumstances, you could lose an event. That's not a good thing. And the event value was improved in 3.1. So it's now absolutely robust, and you won't lose, if it's the driver is well designed, you will not lose events. You may lose intermediate events, but never the latest state. So if, say, you have hot plug control, and the hot plug toggles in quick succession, for example, some sort of <coughs> pin bouncing, you will always get the latest state. You may miss some transitions in between, depending on the size of the event queue but you will always get what it's currently at, and that's very important information. Uh, another really important part is the main media controller. So, modern devices, they support also different drives, video, frame buffer, also, as you can see, even um, But they often relate in some way to one another. SOCs, as I mentioned, they can change the video streaming, so you need a way to dynamically change how blocks inside your uh, SOC are connected up. And you want SOCs to have more control about what is happening. So, what was created was a media controller, this is a device that enumerates your topology, the internal, the internal blocks, and what links are between those blocks in your hardware. Um, written initially for video of Linux, it's not a video of Linux API, it's a separate API. It can, in principle, be used for any type of hardware, and they're actually looking at using this for also. And the media controller, it is, it's really simple, it just enumerates all your blocks and the possible links between them, and it allows you to set links, to change the links between blocks. Nothing else. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a display on my laptop for some reason. Just a week ago I gave the same presentation and it was fine, but for some reason my laptop is black. I need to look there. My apologies. I don't know why, it's a real laptop, so perhaps the support is perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the problem is, okay, you have all these, you have this media controller, you have all these various sub device blocks, Nodes, and if you have a complex hardware, it gets complex. You know, yeah, there's not much you can do about it. So one thing we want to do is to have for each SOC to have a user space library that should probably be based or that will be based on libv for L2, which is already an existing library. And the idea is that you add plugins for your SOC that will take care of all the, the little details to set up proper video pipelines. This is still work in progress, unfortunately. Um, would be nice 
well, one, one reason why it's not progressing as fast as it should is that a lot of the work on media control that was originally funded by Nokia, and as we all know, Nokia has new uh, management and isn't doing anything with business anymore. So we've lost funding in that respect. Um, so anyone with a lot of money? Yes. <laughs> anyway, the media control was merged in 2639. It was a really major piece of work, very important. And to give an idea, this is the OMAP 3 ISP seen through the eyes of the media controller. Uh, it's actually not up to date, it's, a, it's an older version. But the idea is, is uh, good. And actually, this block diagram is almost identical to the block diagram from text instruments. Things have been rearranged, of course, but if you just map it, it's a one, pretty much a one to one mapping. Which is actually what you want to have because this gives you a great overview of your system and how to control it. So what else do we have? Um, we had a video buff framework that was part of the original core of video minutes and it deals with buffer management. So when you capture, you queue up a number of buffers and whenever a frame arrives, it will be DMA into a buffer, you get it back as a user. You can show it, manipulate it, compress it, whatever. When you done this buffer, you give it back to the system. So it's a ring buffer system, and you need management for that, and that was the video of the framework. Unfortunately, whoever wrote it, I don't know who wrote it originally, it's very old. Uh, it was high on some funny mushrooms, and it was just horrible, terrible code. Uh, it didn't, was basically not possible to support modern features like multiplayer support and all the stuff that we wanted to do. So the decision was made after, I actually was in favor of gradually changing and improving video buff, but after lots of talks it was decided, okay, it's too broken, we need to start new. So we came up with video buff 2. I still, uh, still don't like the name, it's very unoriginal. Uh, we should have come up with something better, but well, at least you know it's the second version, and at some point in time the first one will be improved. This was version 2639, and it made possible multiplayer support, where, for example, Luma playing ends up in one place in memory, and Roma playing ends up in another. Uh, one addition that you can make there is that you can also add metadata as a plane. Uh, we don't, don't think we do that at the moment, but there are discussions to add support. Well, we basically have support for that already, technically, but we don't have drivers that do that. Uh, and memory to memory devices for codecs where you give a frame and it will be compressed and you get the compressed result back. So that's all essential stuff and the VB2 framework makes it all possible. Um, codec support. Originally we had mainly support for MPEG1 and MPEG2. Uh, program streams primarily. Support was added for A64, MPEG4, DivX and I think a few other X263 I believe. And that was version 3.1. We also have support for flash controls, not memory, but flash on your digital camera. Um, improved support for JPEG compression. We the, the video JPEG Comp IOTO, which was the original one, was really badly designed. And we had an improved version of that, that's much better. All our improvements, crop and compose. So we always had had to crop. So when you capture a frame, you could say, okay, only give me this part of the frame, and that's what you end up with. What you also, but what you really want to do is not just cropping, but also composing it. You want to say, give me this piece of my captured frame, and compose it into this part of a much larger frame. But that didn't exist, so you would just have to copy. To make things more confusing, for an output device, we only had composing, but no cropping. And we called it cropping, but it was really composing. So nobody knew in the suit what the hell was going on. Uh, so the selection API was created that allows you to actually crop and compose and use the names that you expect for both input and output. Um, so what are fun things? Uh, video for Linux also does radio. Video for Linux TV capture cards already had a tuner. It was easy for hardware guys to add a radio tuner as well. 
And you could say radio is like video without the video. So you know, yeah. <laughs> you left your audio. Um, recently, we have some uh, some devices that could do besides FM tuning, also could do uh, media wave tuning, the AM band. So it's something that used to be supported. Well, we had a very very old ESA driver. That was the only one that actually supported AM tuners. It was hacked. Uh, nobody had hardware anymore. Um, I actually managed to buy one on eBay for way too much money. <laughs> but it actually is still working. And there were some new USB devices that also had support for video wave. So we, we discussed also. It's surprisingly complex to support multiple frequency bands. You'd say, how hard is it? But when I talk about medium wave bands, it turns out that depending on what country you're in, it's actually a different frequency range. And it's, again, way more complex than it should be. So after a long discussion, we finally came up with a good way of dealing with multiple frequency bands, and that's now BIRS 3.6. Another um, interesting radio-related thing, uh, this radio, particularly car receivers, you have RDS, which gives you what channel you're listening to, what sort of program you're listening to, and traffic information in particular. And we had support for that for a long time, but we never had a good decoder library, so you could just get the raw data. There did exist a C++ implementation, which was very bloated, required that you have some daemon running, it was hard to set up. I, don't, I just want to get the packets from my device, run it through a library, and get back something that I understand. So Cisco hired a summer student this summer, and he did a great work in coming up with a library. That's now being part of the FIFRA 2 Utils library. And, um, it's not quite done. There are a few things that still need to be done. Hopefully that will be finished soon, and then it can be released officially. Another important thing, memory handling. Video hardware often reads physically contiguous memory. That's hard to come by as soon as you put your system memory fragments like crazy. So there were all sorts of incompatible solutions, basically all sort of similar, you know, you carve out a piece of memory and set up your own memory pool manager, and it's all a piece of crap usually. Um, solution very much thanks to Samsung was a this contiguous memory allocator, which is a very nice way where you can still reserve a piece of memory, but as long as you don't need it for your buffers, anyone can use it, including applications. As long as any pages allocated in an area can be thrown away or moved away. So whenever your hardware, your video drive needs, I don't know, 64 megabytes of DMA uh, memory, contiguous memory. It will just allocate 64 megabytes, move away any pages that are in the way to some other place, and there you have it. So it has sort of the best of two worlds. You can still, as long as you don't need it, applications can still use it. But if you do need it, the memory will be free for you. This was, uh, I think we went up to version 23 or whatever for this patch set. It was a lot of hard work, and it kudos to Samsung for doing this. It's not trivial at all, but it's a great way of implementing this. And it's extremely easy, you just call DMA all of coherence and you're done. It's currently implemented for ARM. I don't know if it's implemented in the I don't think so. Not yet. It's supposed to be easy to implement it for other architectures, but that's only what I've been told. So your mileage will vary. Um, in progress, Laura mentioned this as well in this presentation. Uh, buffer sharing. So what the holy grail is zero copy pipelining where you capture a frame and can give it almost directly to a, to a GPU to display without ever having to copy from one buffer to another. So uh, through Linaro, because it's very much a cross-subsystem uh, project, and Linaro was very well placed to coordinate that, we came up with DMA buff API. And that's a way where a driver still allocates buffers, say video for Linux allocates buffers, but they can be exported as a DMA buffer handle. 
and then import it in DRM. So DRM will then know, okay, hey, here is all the information for that buffer, and I can now use it directly without having to copy it. Of course, the data in the buffer still has to be understood by both subsystems. It, you know, if one subsystem, subsystem only understands RGB and the other only YV, then it won't work, you will get garbage. So the format has to be the same, and there is no way to negotiate it. You really need to, if you want to set up a pipeline, you really need to know for certain that the two parts get the same format. What is also nice about the Amabos is that it makes it in principle at least possible. You know, some systems have memory that can't be accessed from user space, particularly if you deal with encrypted video. And the Amabo is just an opaque handle, basically. It's a file handle that refers to some internal data structure in the kernel that represents the memory. And in principle, it is possible to use this also to give handles to completely uh, to memory that's only accessible by specialized hardware and given for one block or another. So it could be used, it could be used to solve that problem as well. All the things that are in progress, uh, I'm working on the consumer's electronics control support. That's a pin on the DCMI connector. That is, if you have a home cinema system, you will probably have seen it if it's a reasonably modern one. Where if you change the volume on your TV, using your TV control, it will actually detect that there is an AV receiver and will change the volume on the AV receiver and not on your TV. So consumer electronics control pin is actually one that sort of discovers other devices hooked up all through ACMI and can control that. Now the CAC protocol is well it's a committee uh, design. Which sort of says enough. It's truly, it does everything with the kitchen sink. It's pretty horrible. It's extremely slow. It's about, I think the bus is about 300 pounds. So, yeah, the stone age. Uh, it originated on SCART connectors. Uh, those in Europe will have seen those really big connectors. They won't use much anymore. But that's where it's originated. It's been updated a little bit for HDMI, but the basics are the same. Um, I've been working on this, it's a bit stalled at the moment, I've been busy with other things, but I hope to pick it up whenever I can pick it up. Uh, we, well, Cisco, we really need it in our system as well, and we currently have a proprietary API for that, we want to change it to something that is standardized. It will, be, will not be directly part of Linux Linux because DRM GPUs will also want to use it. Uh, you also have USB dongles, which you connect to your laptop or your PC and you get an HDMI cable comes in and the HDMI cable goes out and it basically controls the cat bit through the USB dongle. So <clears throat> you need something generic. Uh, I have a basic protocol working, but this will work and I need a little more time for that. Another very important tool that I've been working on for quite some time is VFront compliance. VideoFlix API is huge something over an 80 IO tools, I believe. And it is very hard for a driver, right, developer, to make sure that all the fields are filled in correctly, that everything is consistent, that you haven't forgotten anything. And the VFRO compliance tool, basically you run it, you give it the video notes, and it will check all the IO tools, uh, whether the right ones are implemented, whether you didn't implement some that you shouldn't, whether they all will report consistent information, whether all the bit fields are filled in, whether everything is, you know, it, it should all fit together, it should all be correct. Currently I have about 85 to 90% coverage, and it's just to move bit by bit. If you write a driver, run this tool, <coughs> absolutely do that, because it's next to impossible. I think of all the drivers that we have, there are perhaps three or four that comply fully. All the others, they all fail. Not necessarily in, in most of them fail fairly limited ways, so it doesn't actually take that much work to fix them. But they all fail. This is an interesting slide. So I've been working on this for about I think 
four and a half years almost. And this slide is from October 2009, so that's almost exactly three years ago. This was the first time I gave this presentation. And this is the list of results, or this is basically a to-do results that we discussed during the mini summit and that we wanted to implement. So, new timings API, check. Standard event passing API, check. Control framework, check. Buffer call management, it's sort of EMA buff slash EMA, check. Multiplayer, done, media controller, done. I think it's called success. I'm very happy about this. And that's also why this is the last time I'm giving this presentation. Because, <laughs> hey, I've been doing this for three years. And I'm done. I can relax, go home, uh, do all the presentations next year. So, go to Disney World. Go to Disney World, <laughs> yeah, whatever. But I obviously did not do it alone by a long stretch. So, in no particular order, I uh, would like to thank Sumit, Sentinel, and Inao for doing the DMA with API work. Secondly, Ayus and Dokia, and Dokia under previous management, just <laughs> <laughs> for sponsoring events, API, a lot of work with sensors, flash, the OMO3 driver. Okay, it, I mean, it's a real shame from my point of view that Dokia well, yeah, is out of the running. Because they, while it lasts, they did a lot of very good work. They funded a lot of very good work. Goran Pichar for media controller, Unlock 3, Centaurs, and loads of other stuff. Uh, they can stand up. Okay, uh, I don't think Sumit is here. I know Sakari isn't here. Um, Paolo, Sylvester, Mara, Kamil, Samsung in general for doing video bus to CMA, memory to memory, <laughs> It's the last time. They deserve a big thanks for doing that. Mauro. Mauro is here. He is shame. He so, doesn't need to know the status of video, the video. Video for Linux maintainer. <laughs> he uh, had to put up with me and uh, also for all us for all the time and, and try and keep up with all the patches. Um, my employer, originally Tuckberg, uh, acquired my Cisco systems for supporting me for all that time. Absolutely, very much appreciate it. And the Linux Foundation for organizing the media surveys and all these great conferences. Who gives you free hardware? Thank you very much. <laughs> the last chance. At least in this topic.